Hello YouTube family. Uh, today we have a very interesting topic to discuss and I hope you stick with this video until the very end. We're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about breeding by phenotype versus breeding by genotype. And then we're going to talk about breeding in general. Before we talk about the biology of genotype and phenotype and discuss breeding in general, do me a please uh, quick favor. Please hit the subscribe button and the notification icon. It helps the YouTube algorithm uh, know about our channel and uh, it helps us out. So if you find this content interesting or enjoyable, please help us out by subscribing. Alright, so first things first. What is breeding by genotype versus by phenotype? Phenotype is breeding by how a dog looks. The dogs might not be genetically related in the slightest, but they look similar. For example, let's say you have German Shepherds and you're breeding a show line German Shepherd. You're breeding a black and tan with a red dark pigment, which is very attractive, to another dog, black and red, with a dark pigment. And you will get black and red puppies because the parents are both black and red. They're both show lines, and so the pups will look very similar as a consequence of having similar looking parents. Uh, there is a feeling that sometimes people marry somebody who kind of looks like them a little bit, or may remind them of a parent or grandparent. I don't know if that's true or not, <clears throat> but it might be true, I'm not sure. But in dogs, where we control <laughs> who gets married, uh, there's definitely uh, breeding by phenotype. Now, let's say you were to breed, uh, let's say you were to marry a, a man with blue eyes or a woman with green eyes. Let's say we have double B, capital B, lowercase b, which is a recessive, and some would come out uppercase b, lowercase b, some would come out uppercase b, and some would come out lowercase b, both recessive. As long as the child had green eyes, whether that's uh, as a dominant and recessive combo or a recessive combo, ma uh, creating a trait, a single trait, um, as the basis of the breeding is something you don't care about if there's a relationship by genotype. In other words, you're breeding by eye color as a single attribute. So breeding by phenotype is breeding by a visible trait. Is that wrong to do? Well, if you're breeding by phenotype and there's no genetic connection between the parents, uh, you have hybrid vigor, meaning that the lack of genetic relatedness between the parents means that the animals will be highly fertile, highly healthy, have thicker skin, which is desirable, uh, good vitality, good lung capacity, strong hearts, unless of course one of the parents is sickly, then it doesn't matter you in breeding or lying breeding or not doing it at all and you're completely outcrossing. So you know, we're assuming two very healthy individuals here. We're not assuming any one of the two have any negative attributes in terms of physical health or vitality. As a consequence of breeding two unrelated individuals to each other, in that generation you will have hybrid vigor and therefore the offspring will come out fabulous. <clears throat> but if that generation comes out fabulous, there's no prepotency, so therefore it will not pass into the generation after that. Meaning that in order to pass attributes, you have to have uh, prepotency. Prepotency means that you have what's called homozygous genes, or the same genes, and you have heterozygous genes, or different genes. When you have an inbreeding, or a milder version of it, line breeding, you are doubling up on the allele pairs from both the father's side and mother's side of the pedigree. In other words, you have to have an ancestor in common at the top of the pedigree and the bottom of the pedigree. So if you're looking at line breeding, that same... Now, first of all, what does line breeding mean? And let's just define that term. What is line breeding? What is inbreeding? Inbreeding is the mating of closely related relatives, mother to son, father to daughter, 
grandfather to granddaughter, grandmother to grandson, and there exists a mating in the immediate family of directly related ancestors. That is inbreeding. Lion breeding has two different definitions depending on which one you choose to use. In the first definition of lion breeding, you're inbreeding on a specific ancestor, not just all over the place, but on a specific ancestor which appears several times in the pedigree. You're essentially trying to recreate him, for lack of a better term. And he could be an uncle at the top of the pedigree and a grandfather at the bottom of the pedigree. The bottom line is he appears twice, once on the mother's side, once on the father's side, and his genes are combined because they're passed through both sides of the pedigree, the female part of the pedigree and the male part of the pedigree. That ancestor is passed because he's repeated. Therefore, there's a greater chance of doubling up on his genes or allele pairs. The more closely he is related, in other words, the closer he is in time to the offspring you're dealing with, the greater his influence. The further back in time he is, the less his influence. So all the other dogs in that pedigree are completely unrelated to just a lot of other dogs. Great-grandparents, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, great-great-grandfathers, great-great-great-grandmothers. So you're dealing with a lot of unrelated blood, but one ancestor out of many ancestors is the same dog in the top and the bottom of the pedigree, and you're therefore line breeding on him. In other words, you're bringing in line to him. What's an extreme example of that? An extreme example of that, again, we're going to go back to inbreeding, not line breeding, would be a father bred to his own daughter, and then the outcome of that breeding bred again back to that father. That would be a seven-eighths dog. That's an extreme version, but what are you doing? You're cutting down the mother's genes and you're increasing the sire's genes. Uh, that's a, not a good practice, but that's what's called back breeding. Uh, an extreme form of inbreeding is full siblings. Now you're doubling up on both parents, the mother and father, not just one parent. Half siblings, you would be, be doubling up on one parent. Full siblings, you're doubling up on both parents. So I'm not recommending that. I'm just explaining the difference between inbreeding and line breeding. So in line breeding, uh, what are examples of line breeding? First cousins, second cousins third cousins, uncle to niece, grand uncle to niece, aunt to nephew, grand aunt to nephew. Those are lion breeding. Now some of you will say, well doesn't that cause disease? Aren't you asking for problems by doing this? And that's not a straightforward answer. You could breed two animals which are not related to each other and still have disease. So the reason inbreeding is seen as making disease is because people are lazy and pe people pick the dogs which are convenient and at hand. They're not going to go out of their way to find a relative of the, your dog in Europe, for example, and you have to pay a greater fee to fly the dog over, or you have to fly frozen semen over from a dog out of Europe, or you might have to travel two, three hours away and stay in a hotel to get a breeding from a dog which is related to your dog, but it's not close by. People breed what's convenient, people breed what's nearby, and so you're inbreeding an inferior quality animals, and therefore you're creating problems for yourself because you're not taking the time to select the healthiest specimens. So that's number one. Number two, Inbreeding itself does not cause disease. The disease is already there. What you're doing is by, let's say it's a recessive trait, meaning it's a hidden trait. It's masked by a dominant trait. Uh, therefore, you don't see the disease. Now, another relative of the same line carries that same recessive gene that when met with the other recessive gene from the other part of the pedigree, because that ancestor is common to both parts of the pedigree, now that two recessive genes meet each other and therefore you have disease. So inbreeding doesn't create bad genes, inbreeding exposes bad genes. What do you have to do? You have to cull. You have to uh, castrate that male or do a hysterectomy of that female. It will be put into the pet population but not be used as breeding stock. But what do you get 
as well. Well, the ones which remain, which don't have that combination of two recessive traits combining, didn't get the disease. And therefore, eventually you come up with very pure blood and you come up with a very uh, healthy individual because you've limited out or cast out all the bad individuals which carry the recessive genes, which usually are the genes that carry disease. So inbreeding can actually be used to improve your lifestyle because you're culling out the weak and therefore only keeping the strong. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's actually a strategy. Now, some breeders get tired, and most breeders are not elite breeders. What do I mean by elite breeders? A breeder makes his money selling puppies. You could sell any puppies from any male and any female, and you will make puppies. The act of breeding animals is not about the physical sex of male and female. That is not breeding. Breeding is involving planning a litter, doing health and genetic testing of the litter, titling the parent dog so you see what attributes they have, and you want to pass on certain attributes to improve the breed. Um, for example, let's say you want a protection dog and you want a guarding instinct or a certain degree of aggression in the animal, which is appropriate for that breed. Let's say uh, breeding Rottweilers. A certain amount of aggression is appropriate. It's not a poodle. It's a Rottweiler. Now, aggression is a genotype trait, not a phenotype trait. Or you want a certain degree of prey drive. That's a genotype trait. That's not a phenotype trait. So certain temperament attributes are only passed through genotype, not through phenotype. Now, if the dog has a heavy bone structure and is very muscular, that's a phenotype trait. That's what, how the dog looks, which will be passed on to its offspring. But that's not a genotype trait because past that first generation of breeding, it will not pass forward. Now, first you must understand gene pools and you must understand your breed. A good breeder participates in his breed, either in AKC shows, they show their dogs, they participate in confirmation shows, if it's a German Shepherd, they participate in IGP, which used to be called Schutzhund. Same thing for Rottweilers and Dobermans, in other words, it's a performance breed. So some of the breeding decisions are made based on performance. You're breeding best to best based on performance. In fact, the Dutch Shepherd, uh, today's Dutch Shepherd, is really a brindled Malinois in some ways, and is not really a pure breed anymore. It's an open stud book. So the breeding is done by performance. So you mostly have a brindled Malinois, but if a German Shepherd can increase size, to give you greater ability to take down a suspect, then the German Shepherd will be thrown in. If a Great Dane was needed to increase height of the dog, a Great Dane will be thrown in. In other words, it's mostly pure-blooded, but an occasional other breed is thrown in, and that's an extreme example of outcrossing. Not outcrossing within the breed, but outcrossing to an outside breed. Now, will you have a high degree of hybrid vigor? Yes. That's why mongrels, in general, are, are healthier than purebreds, because they are a mix of breeds, therefore they have the highest degree of hybrid vigor. But can you create dogs for people without having breeds? Are all dogs the same? The answer is they're not. If you want a dog, for example, to be a great retriever and go good duck hunting, you have to develop a retrieving breed, which shows the retrieving instinct. If you want a great service dog, which can guide the blind, you need to have a breed bred for that task. If you want a dog to work with the police, a German Shepherd is a great example, which is highly trainable and highly intelligent, but can also have the physical power to take down the suspect. You need a German Shepherd or a Belgian Malinois. In other words, breeds are based on purpose and a goal. Unfortunately, today's pet marketplace People have gotten away from breeding dogs for a purpose. It's just, oh, it's just a pet. Don't give me papers. I just want a pet. If you don't want to register the dog 